Hi, my name is Monica Butnager. I'm a speech language pathologist on the Stroke Rehabilitation Team at St. Mary's of the Lake Hospital. It's a pleasure for me to present to you today Section 3, Communication, from your Tips and Tools for Everyday Living Manual. Here is an overview of the presentation that you'll hear today. Characteristics of successful communication partners. We'll discuss post-stroke problems that make communication harder. Impacts of impaired communication. Specific communication impairments that are related to stroke. We'll talk about some strategies to improve communication. We'll show you some videotape demonstrations and then give you some ideas on how you can practice this for yourselves. The goal from this presentation is to introduce you to some tips and tools in order for you to accomplish more successful communication. Communication challenges are very common after stroke. The reduced ability to communicate is extremely upsetting to survivors. As healthcare providers, there are a number of things that you can do to help yourself and your residents interact more effectively. Some of you may ask, how will this information help me? We're hoping that it will help to reduce stress, improve residents' outcomes, result in more successful and efficient interactions, and increase independence for your residents. Give them some sense of control over their environments, ultimately improving their quality of lives. Successful communication should include a sense of respect for each other, respect for the other person's message, that it's relevant and important, a clear message, a desire to actually understand what the other person is saying, and a trust in the other person to listen. In other words, that they're actually interested in what you have to say, as well as empathy for each other. When the message does not get across, which will happen once in a while, we need to maintain a sense of optimism that the communication will in fact take place, if not now, but at some point in time. We need to demonstrate patience and persistence. We need to try and try again. We need to demonstrate creativity. Use different methods and different words. Get to know your resident, even if it's one or two key things about that person. Make it personal. Be honest when you don't understand. For example, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith. I'm not sure what you're trying to say. Can we try again later? Accept some of the responsibility for a breakdown in communication. For example, I must be having a bad morning. Can we try again later? Communication is both verbal and nonverbal. The verbal is the talking part. The nonverbal component includes body language, facial expression, tone of voice, and gestures. The nonverbal message is often more powerful and meaningful than the verbal one, especially when the two don't match. For example, I'm fine. Which did you believe, the verbal or the nonverbal? Remember, stroke survivors are less able to adjust their communication. As healthcare providers, you need to take on this role to help ensure successful interactions with your residents. You are essentially the most frequent, if not the most important, communication partner for your resident. There are a number of post-stroke problems that may make communication more difficult, such as physical limitations. Your resident may not be able to move their wheelchair to get to the person that they want to speak with. They may have hearing or vision problems. They may not hear you or they may need to be offered their glasses. They may not be able to communicate face to face if they can't stand up. Some cannot alter their facial expressions. So it might not be very easy to see how they're feeling. You may need to ask. Some aren't able to manage their personal care anymore. If they cannot put their dentures on, brush their hair, or put a little bit of makeup on, this may not make them feel very good. They may feel embarrassed and may not want to be part of social interaction. 
Some may have slower or inappropriate responses. A few seconds to get a word out may seem like an eternity for your resident. Page 15 of your Tips and Tools Manual has an excellent chart that lists many post-stroke problems that can affect communication along with helpful strategies you can use. You can potentially compensate for these impairments by changing the way in which you communicate with your residents. There are a number of impacts of impaired communication. Your residents may be perceived as being less intelligent or less competent, which may not be the case. They may have feelings of loneliness and social isolation. They may feel frustrated or angry, even embarrassed. You may see outbursts due to miscommunication. Low mood or sadness may be a problem. Many residents often need adaptations to their environment, making them feel like burdens. Overall, this leads to less opportunities and desire to communicate. Take a moment to imagine the following. How would it feel if you knew what you wanted to say, but you just couldn't find the words? How would it feel to understand what people are saying, but be treated as if you don't? Most people can imagine that this would feel extremely frustrating and potentially very lonely. Other ways you may feel are angry, helpless, sad, or depressed. What behaviors may you see if someone does not understand or cannot express their needs clearly? Your residents may demonstrate outbursts, agitation, or show signs of withdrawal from people and social situations. Keep this in mind as we discuss the next portion of this presentation. There are a number of small changes that you can make that could potentially make big differences with yourself and your residents. Get the person's attention before speaking. Ask how your resident would like to be addressed. Introduce yourself and your purpose in being there. You may have to introduce yourself many times if there's memory problems. Large, easy to read name tags are often very helpful. Avoid talking about the resident in his or her presence unless they're part of the conversation. Be calm and direct. Speak in a regular tone of voice. Adjust the environment and be aware of those nonverbal messages. There are some specific communication impairments related to stroke. They include aphasia, dysarthria, cognitive communication impairments, and apraxia of speech. For the purposes of this presentation, I will focus on the first three as these are the areas that are focused on in your Tips and Tools Manual. It's helpful to understand the difference between speech and language before we discuss the various communication impairments. Some of them affect speech and some of them affect language. Simply put, speech is the mechanical act of making sounds. Speech consists of speech sounds, voice quality, loudness, melody of speech, and rate. Language is the use of words to express thoughts and ideas. Language includes the ability to talk, read, write, and understand. Aphasia is a language problem. Page 18 in Section 3 and all of Section 12 in your Tips and Tools Manual is dedicated to the topic of aphasia and includes even more helpful information for you to review. Simply put, aphasia is usually due to damage to the left hemisphere of the brain, where for most people, the language area resides. There are different types of aphasia, and often the resident will also have some right-sided body weakness or paralysis. Aphasia may affect a survivor's ability to talk, understand, read, and or write. Because communication is often associated with mental ability, people often underestimate the abilities of a survivor with aphasia. However, survivors can often think, plan, decide, and reason. They can even sometimes produce some clear words. 
They understand facial expressions and gestures. People who have difficulty understanding the words that you're saying will often pay even closer attention to your body language and other nonverbal cues to get an idea of what it is you're trying to tell them. When somebody has difficulty understanding what you're saying, there are some ways that you can help them to get the message in. Speak to them face to face. Use one idea at a time with short sentences. Print key words on paper if possible. Use gestures and facial expression. Ask them yes no questions. Draw simple pictures or use pre made pictures if available. Simple drawings can work really well. Verbally acknowledge if the situation becomes difficult and accept some of the responsibility of a communication breakdown as we talked about previously. As with any new skill, it will take time to feel comfortable using some of these strategies. Every resident is different, as is every healthcare provider. The important thing is to try. It can make all the difference in your resident's day if you at least try to have an interaction with them. In addition, if you discover a strategy that works very well for any particular resident, don't keep it to yourselves. Share it with the people that you work with, with family members, and if possible, ask for permission from your resident to post the information in a place where other workers and people can make use of it. Asking yes no questions requires some practice. Start with broad questions and then get more specific. For example, Mr. Smith, are you talking about your family? Oh great, it's your family. Is it your sister? Is it your wife? Using one idea at a time is very important. For example, if you enter your residence room and say the following, I'll help you get up, showered and dressed, and then I'm going to take you to the dining room for breakfast, but first you need to take your pill. This can be extremely overwhelming. Instead, break it up into one idea at a time. Here is your pill to take. Now I'm going to help you take a shower. Then I'll help you get dressed. After all that, I'll take you for breakfast. When an individual has trouble expressing words and sentences, there are a number of ways that you can help them get their message out. Give them ample time for their responses. A small amount of time now can add up to hours of time saved when you don't have to deal with the frustration and potential outbursts that may come with instances of miscommunication. Encourage writing. Encourage gestures and pointing. Ask them to show you what they would like. Ask yes no questions. Write down yes and no. Maybe they can point. Verify what you've understood. Identify the general topic and then move on to details. Use a communication or alphabet board and or pictures. Encourage all attempts at communication. And acknowledge a lack of time if needed. For example, Mr. Smith, I'm sorry, I don't have much time right now. And point to your watch. Is it okay if we try again later? And just make sure that you do come back and try again. Dysarthria is a motor speech problem. It involves difficulty controlling the speech muscles. Often the damage results in slow, weak, or less coordinated movements of the muscles needed for speech production. Sometimes their speech may sound slurred or mixed up. Survivors with pure dysarthria have usually not lost language. They often can think, plan, decide, and reason. They may understand what you're saying. They may be able to read, write, or type, or use computers or other devices to help them get their message across. There are a number of things that you can do to help someone with dysarthria. Start by communicating in a quiet place and when the resident is well rested. Encourage the resident to slow down and speak louder, which can help make their speech easier to understand. Speak face to face. Use gestures. Repeat the parts that you understood. 
it's very frustrating for your resident to say three sentences and then have to repeat the whole thing when you may have understood a word or two. For example, Mr. Smith, I understood this part. Can you fill in the rest for me? Jot down notes as the resident talks to help keep track of what's being said. It may be easier for the resident to write information, so ask them if they would like a pen and paper. Consider using pictures once again. Now we'll discuss cognitive communication impairments. Page 20, Table 4 of your Tips and Tool Manual nicely lays out a list of cognitive communication problems along with a number of excellent strategies that you can try. I will provide an overview here. Cognitive communication impairments are usually the result of right hemisphere strokes, severe strokes, or multiple strokes. It may include difficulties with organizing the resident's thoughts. So they may be able to talk, but it's not always easy to follow what they're saying. It may not make sense. They may have trouble understanding what people say. They may have trouble with memory, concentration, and attention. So although they may have heard what you said and understood it, they may not remember it as soon as you walk out the door. They often have difficulty with humor and social language skills. They might make little eye contact, interrupt, or make inappropriate comments. They may have trouble picking up nonverbal messages. For example, they're not always good at reading subtle body language or facial expression cues. They might have a left visual field in attention or neglect and have difficulties with verbal problem solving or coming up with various solutions to difficulties that they're having. Survivors with right hemisphere communication impairments, they may be able to speak clearly in fluent sentences understand direct, concrete information. They may be able to read and write. There are a number of things you can do when communicating with a survivor who has cognitive impairments. Provide reminders of the topic being discussed if needed. Ask specific questions to get more information. Accommodate for any left inattention. For example, present materials, books, and stand to the right side of the survivor. Be direct in your language. Avoid any subtleties or sarcasm. Provide immediate feedback if the resident is coming across as being rude. Remember, it's not being done on purpose. Provide them with alternatives. Give them short printed information to help remember and understand what you've told them. We will now share with you two clips of a patient with a healthcare provider. Keep in mind the following questions as you view the first scenario. What communication impairment does this resident likely have? What are some of the strategies used to get the healthcare provider's message in? What are some of the strategies used to get the survivor's message out? Which strategies could the healthcare worker use to help get the message in and out? Overall, was this an effective interaction? Good morning, Paul. Good morning. How are you doing? <laughs> oh, you've got a cold there, eh, Paul? That's too bad. That's too bad. You rang the call bell. <laughs> Chair or in the bathroom? No. Okay. Uh, oh, boy. I love Paul, I'm sorry. I just don't understand what you're saying. Can Can you try to tell me again? Oh, Paul, I'm so sorry.
sorry, I'm just not understanding what you're saying. I don't think I've worked with you enough. Can oh. we can we try again later? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. What communication impairment does this resident likely have? Mainly dysarthria. What are some of the strategies used to get the healthcare provider's message in? She acknowledged the difficulty in communication and apologized and took some responsibility for the communication breakdown. What are some of the strategies used to get the survivor's message out? She provided some time for him to respond. Which strategies could the healthcare worker use to help get the message in and out? She could get down to the same level and speak face to face, not raise her voice so much, use a pen and paper, ask yes no questions, and first establish the topic, then move on to the specifics, and pay attention to the resident's gestures. Overall, was this an effective interaction? Not quite, because the message was not understood. Keep in mind the following questions as you view the next scenario. What are some of the strategies used to get the healthcare provider's message in? And what are some of the strategies used to get the survivor's message out? Overall, was this an effective interaction? Good morning, Paul. Good morning. How are you doing? Good you. How are you? <laughs> oh, my cough? Yeah. It's better. Thanks for asking. Hi. You rang your call bell, Paul. Part of that message, Paul. So, are there two things that you want to tell me? Two. Okay, so there's two things. Can you start with the first one? Is it something to do with your arm? No. no it's not your arm. Here, I'll, I'll draw a picture, Paul, and that might help us figure out what part of the body you're talking about. Yep. Here it is. The, is it the left shoulder? Yes. Okay. So there's something going on. Yes. It's okay. Yes. So what's going on with your left shoulder? Sorry, Paul. I'm not quite understanding that word. I know. Great. If you could spell it for me, that would be great. Do you need your glasses? to use your alphabet board? No. Okay, so go ahead. B. P. A. A. I. I. I N. N. Okay, so you have pain in your left shoulder. Whoa. Okay. Does the doctor know about the pain? No. It's probably a good idea if we let him know today. Is that okay with you? Yes. What was the second thing you wanted to tell me? Okay, so now Paul, can you give me the key words? I, I saw that you, you showed me the phone. Is it something about a phone? So you want me to do something with the phone? Oh, you want me to phone somebody? I know. Okay. Who do you want me to phone? W. W? I. I. M. F. E. Okay, great. You want me to phone your wife. Can you just confirm with me? I'll just draw a clock here. Can you confirm with me what time? Eleven. Eleven. Is it eleven o'clock? Yes. So, what would you like me to tell her? You mean you are here? Here? Oh, do you want her to come here yes. and visit you? Okay. So, let me just make sure I have it right. 
You want me to call your wife Rosa. at 11 o'clock and ask her to come here to visit you. Uh, Great. Is there anything else, Paul? No, I Perfect. It was nice seeing you. Nice you. What are some of the strategies used to get the healthcare provider's message in? She spoke face to face, focused on one idea at a time, used short sentences, printed key words, used gestures and facial expression, asked effective yes no questions, drew simple pictures, and verbally acknowledged that she did not understand the message and needed it broken down for her. And what are some of the strategies used to get the survivor's message out? She responded to his gestures, asked for key words, asked effective yes-no questions, verified what she understood, identified the topic, then moved on to the details, used simple drawings, and used an alphabet board. Overall, this was a very effective interaction. Try to keep the basics in mind when communicating with a stroke survivor. Be patient, persistent, and honest, and accept some responsibility for communication breakdowns. By helping to get the message in and out, using some of the tips and tools you've learned today, such as printing key words, drawing pictures, asking yes-no questions, and using gestures, not only are you promoting successful and efficient interactions, you are also helping to reduce stress and increase independence.